From the Toronto Star, I'm Rudy Mudder, and this matters. Have you heard the latest buzz about this summer's most newsworthy insects? It's time to enjoy the great outdoors, but as anyone who's gone camping or visited a cottage knows, we share that space with plenty of creepy crawlies. Beyond the humble mosquito, there are a few insects each year who take a bite out of the spotlight, and this year is no exception. From cicadas to ticks, which are a bug to take very seriously, to caterpillar moth infestations and more, we are talking insects and for whom the bug bites toll. Dr. Andrew Young is the assistant professor of systematic entomology at the University of Guelph, which is also home to the oldest insect collection in Canada. He joins us to talk about some of the buzzworthy bugs making news this year. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. It's fun. Andrew, you know, we reached the summer and this is one of these things that you study insects all the time, but one of the things I'm really curious about right now is is that someone in this field, what do you make of all the media reports when a bug all of a sudden becomes the newsmaker? Yeah, it's been interesting to watch and sometimes it's pretty obvious like with uh, I think we're going to talk about the periodical cicadas a bit and you know when when things start to emerge by the millions and millions all at once and they're large insects, it's kind of obvious why they show up in the news. You know, other things, there may be disease transmission risks, or um, in some cases, I think maybe it's just people getting outside more than they used to and noticing things that they wouldn't have otherwise. So, yeah, I think with each insect that makes the news, you sort of have to take it on a case-by-case basis, but it's always interesting for some reason. You mentioned the first newsmaker I want to talk about, and it's the cicadas and brood X. Yes. I mean, I honestly, when you when you say it like that, it sounds like a huge deal. It does. Now, this really isn't our area, but I'm curious, is that, has that come and gone? And where is this exactly happening? They have pretty much come and gone. Yeah, they're down sort of in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. There's various species of what we call periodical cicadas or magicicada, the genus magicicada. They're often referred to as 17-year cicadas, but some of them actually appear every 13 years instead, depending on the particular brood. They're a really cool species. They have this weird life cycle where they spend 17 or 13 years underground as a nymph, just sort of quietly feeding on tree roots. And then all of the individuals of the species will emerge as adults at the same time, you know, every 17 years, and they create a massive buzz, you know, literally and figuratively. Right. So you have cicadas all over the place. They're out from about May to June. So they would be done by now down in D.C. But yeah, and I'm sure lots of people saw videos of them just buzzing away and causing a bit of a commotion down there. I think you think these guys are pretty cool, right? I do. Yeah, they're really cool. Why? I haven't actually seen them in person before, but it's on my bucket list. If it weren't for COVID, I might have driven down there this year. Is it just a delay between this giant swarm? Like what makes them cool? Yeah, sort of the, just the sheer numbers here. There are, I can't think of many other insects that come out in quite that abundance when it's such a large insect and it's so obvious and they make so much noise. You know, they're supposed to be one of the loudest insects in the United States and also Canada. You know, if they made it up this far, they would be. So yeah, they just kind of, it's impossible to ignore them. And uh, as someone that studies insects where people often sort of overlook insects, I find that fascinating. It's also nice that they're not really pests. You know, these aren't invasive. They cause maybe a little bit of damage to trees, but then all of the bodies going back into the soil after they die also fertilize the trees. So, you know, people find them alarming sometimes, but they're not actually uh, problematic species. They're not causing damage to agriculture. They should be here. They're a native species. So, yeah, I don't know. I think they're pretty cool. Okay, it's funny, you lead me to my next question because a lot of people are a bit concerned and I want to be very clear first about the naming of the next insect we're going to talk about. It has been previously referred to as the gypsy moth. Obviously, that's not the greatest name in the world. Uh, So we're going to be using the short form for its scientific name, which is Lymantria dispar dispar or LDD. These caterpillar moths are around. They're eating up a lot of trees. People are concerned. Can you tell us a little bit about them and whether people should be concerned? Yeah, absolutely. You know, LDD works. I often refer to them just as Lymantria, which is the genus name. It translates roughly as destroyer, which is actually pretty metal. So, you know, kind of (laughs) neat. They are concerning in that they are an invasive species. You know, they were introduced into North America in, I want to say, late 1800s. 
there was a guy down in the States, Massachusetts. He wanted to crossbreed them with native silk moths and create a North American silkworm industry. That failed. They escaped immediately and became pests. Within 10 years of them escaping, there were already the first reports of sort of massive swarms defoliating trees in the area. So they really became an invasive species that you know, started causing outbreaks really quickly. That said, they are one of these species that goes through these sort of natural boom and bust population cycles where you know, there'll be relatively few of them for many years, and then their population will start to ramp up and ramp up and ramp up until we get a year like this or last year where there's just caterpillars everywhere. And right now in Ontario, we are in the worst outbreak in the history of Ontario in terms of acres of defoliation being caused. That said, because they do go through these natural boom and bust population cycles, as their population increases, right now the populations of their predators are increasing. So there are various fungal and viral pathogens that will target them. There are other insects that will eat them, mostly that have been introduced from their native range as well. So scientists have found things in Europe and Asia that might target Lamantria, and they've been introduced here to help control the populations. So, you know, there are some sprays people use, especially early in the season when they're very small caterpillars, and those will help, but they also kill a lot of native species. And it sort of just slows this natural boom-bust cycle down. So from my perspective... It makes sense that if you have a particular tree in your yard that you want to protect, like an oak tree or something that they really like, you know, manually remove the caterpillars and keep an eye on it. And some people wrap burlap around the trunk and the burlap doesn't stop the caterpillars from moving, but they will hide under it during the day. And so then you can kind of just check under the burlap and kill a whole bunch of caterpillars on a daily basis. But frankly, to me, on a kind of macro Ontario wide scale, it does make sense to just kind of let this cycle continue. And next spring, if we get a wetter spring instead of one of these droughty springs, then hopefully these fungal pathogens will help knock their populations down to a more reasonable level. Because the other thing that's happening is as we get higher and higher populations of caterpillars, they do start to compete with each other, right? They are out competing their own siblings and, you know, conspecific other Lamantria caterpillars for food right now. So as their population increases, the individual caterpillars are actually getting weaker and weaker and compromising their immune systems because they're overcrowded and overpopulated and stressed. So at a certain point, this does reach a tipping point where the caterpillars become very vulnerable to their predators and pathogens. And hopefully that'll happen by next year, especially if we get a bit of a cooler spring, that'll really encourage that to happen. I've heard some campgrounds like the Pinery are letting these guys basically run their course as opposed to really doing any sort of intervention, right? Exactly, yeah. And is that the way to go? I think so, yeah. Especially for a larger natural area, like a park, Again, you know, if there's a tree near the visitor center that people really like, or it's already at, at risk, you know, it's worth protecting that. But trying to spray an entire provincial park or national park or wilderness area for caterpillars with a spray that will also kill a whole bunch of the native species, you're probably just prolonging the outbreak by doing that. I'm not, I should also say, I'm not a pest entomologist. This isn't my specialty. This is more from reading what other entomologists have said. And I do kind of agree with them that if you look at these uh, population cycles, generally it kind of, it works to let it run its course. And, uh, you know, they're not agriculturally significant. They're not destroying crops. So they're not destroying people's livelihoods. So we don't have to worry about that at least. Okay. The one that I think we do have to worry about a little bit, because we're hearing a lot of them and they're reportedly on the rise. Ticks. Yes. Now, what can you tell me about them? And obviously this is more serious because... Some of these can cause Lyme disease, right? Exactly. Why is there more of them around this year? Well, ticks breed better and they survive winters better when they have a longer summer season and then a shorter, milder winter. So unfortunately, as you know, climate change continues and we keep getting milder and milder winters in southern Ontario and then longer, hotter summers, we're going to get more ticks. You know, we have plenty of deer, we have plenty of rodents in southern Ontario, and so those help spread them around. And so uh, once you have lots of them in any wilderness area, it's going to be really hard to get rid of the ticks. You know, that said, with the milder winters, we also have opossums moving up from down south and they eat a lot of ticks. So a single opossum can eat 5,000 ticks a season. So there is a little bit of mitigation going on. But I think at this point, our winters are mild enough that ticks are just sort of a new fact of life for southern and eastern Ontario. And you're right. They're a significant health threat in a sense. You know, you do have to be careful of these things. We'll be right back. I read a piece of this, you know, one of the reasons is the more of them is that there was disruption in their food chain, or is this a climate change related at all or anything like that? 
I think it's climate change in that they can now establish themselves further north. But as far as their food source is being disrupted, I mean, we have plenty of deer and other mammals in southern Ontario. So I don't think it's that. I think they're just becoming more frequent in places that people like to go to. You know, at this point, any area with sort of long grass or shrubs where you're hiking. So even within the city, you know, if you're down in the Rouge Valley or something, you should be aware of ticks. Ontario has a good website now. I wrote this down. So, you know, anything else I talk about, you know, if if, if I'm wrong, that's not good. But if I'm wrong about health stuff, then I would, uh, I'd feel really bad about that. So the first thing I would do, seriously, anyone who's interested in outdoor recreation, you know, be it camping, hiking, walking their dogs in wilderness areas, whatever, I really highly recommend they check out the Ontario page on Lyme disease. It has photos of ticks. It has photos of the species of tick that actually can transmit it, which is the deer tick. It shows risk range areas. It has recommendations on clothing you should be wearing when you're in tick related areas. And it's pretty good. Before anything else, I would say if you're an outdoorsy person, do do a little bit of reading. It's not too complicated, but it is worth being aware of. And sort of the precautions, actually, generally are tick checks after being outside, and there's a, a red ring to their bites, right? For some. Yeah. So generally, if I'm in an outdoor area, I will... This looks super cool. I tuck my pants into my socks, and I try and wear light-colored pants, and then I wear a long sleeve shirt, which is also light-colored, and I tuck that into my belt. Because ticks will tend to kind of keep walking up your body until they find some exposed skin. So if you do that, usually I don't find the ticks embedded on me. I find them walking around in my clothes looking for some exposed skin. But yeah, when you're done, if you're done for the day being outside, I throw all my clothes directly in the dryer to cook anything that's alive. And you do a tick check, check back your knees, groin, armpits, hairline. If you have a mirror, that's helpful for checking your back. Otherwise, you know, get someone else to help you out. Yeah, you, you have to be aware of them. They don't embed right away. So again, I haven't actually found any embedded on me this entire season. And I've been out at least once a week. I just keep finding them crawling on the outside of my clothes, but it happens. You know, sometimes they get in where you didn't tuck your pants in, or you're just going for a short walk. So you didn't think about it. And yeah, it's, it's worth removing them as soon as you can. Again, it would be better to actually do a little reading or watch a YouTube video on how to remove them. But I just use tweezers and kind of gently pull them out, making sure to remove the mouth parts. If you do get bitten, save the body. You know, you can put it in a Ziploc bag, put it in your freezer because Lyme disease is complicated, right? So there's two ticks in Ontario or two ticks. Mostly there are other species, but they're really rare in the South. Generally, if you're on a ticks, it'll be a dog tick, which doesn't transmit it and is larger or a deer tick, which can transmit Lyme disease and unfortunately is smaller. So they're easy to miss. If you do get bitten by a tick that has Lyme disease, it usually will not transmit it unless it's embedded on your body for upwards of 24 hours or more. So if you remove them quickly, you should be fine. Still worth saving the body. If you do happen to get Lyme disease, usually you will get that red ring rash. It's called the bullseye rash where you have the bite and then sort of a red circle appears around it. Not always though. The worst part about Lyme is the symptoms are not consistent. Some people do not get the rash. You know, often you get muscle aches and that sort of thing. Sometimes you get insomnia. I have a friend who's also an entomologist and she didn't get the rash and she didn't get any muscle aches, but she suddenly started getting really bad insomnia and knew that she'd been bitten by a tick a couple of weeks ago. And so she got checked out and sure enough, she did have Lyme disease. So that's really the most important thing. And the trickiest thing with Lyme disease is knowing that none of the symptoms are 100% indicative. You don't necessarily get any of the symptoms. So really, it does pay to be aware of ticks. If you find one on yourself, keep it in case you have to bring it to a doctor and monitor for potential symptoms after that. And it all sounds very scary. But, you know, if you think about it, ticks are very common throughout the states. You know, everywhere, just barely south of Ontario already always had these. And so, um, you know, these are a fact of life that lots of people adjust to for outdoor activities. And it's just sort of one more thing you should be aware of, you know, safety. Well, speaking of safety, while we are on the scary ones, we have to talk about last year's big newsmaker, the giant Asian hornet or the very well-branded murder hornet. What's the update on those? I believe there's been maybe one nest found in BC, but yeah. really not much. Okay, so the branding is a little irritating. You know, these are just another species of hornet. They're not murderous. They're not out to get your kids or anything like that. They are alarmingly big. I have seen them in their native range. They're very large insects. Yeah, I think there was one colony removed from Vancouver this year. 
But other than that, they've just sort of, there's been occasional ones setting up in sort of Washington State, Oregon area, and people have been removing them pretty aggressively. As far as I can tell, they're not really established in North America, but even if they were, I don't think they would be in the East. You know, they are essentially a tropical insect. They don't really like the cold. Subtropical at best. So, you know, the really mild winters out in Vancouver might be able to sustain them. I'd be surprised if they ever showed up in Ontario. Lots of people send photos in thinking they've seen them in Ontario. They're almost always a cicada killer, which is a native species of wasp that doesn't really bother in humans at all. They're solitary. They target cicadas. Or the queen of a European hornet, which, you know, they're from Europe. They are also shockingly large, but they're still not as big as these Asian hornets. So they're not really on my radar. They're another insect that I think is kind of neat, but I'd be surprised if we see them in Ontario. I just came back from camping and I was eaten alive. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering, like, what is it about humans that draw bugs to them? Is there a thing that for some reason they find certain people more, say, attractive or delicious than others? I mean, as an entomologist, I figure you have been in many a swarm. So does this happen? Is this actually a thing or not? Is this a myth? I think it is. I've heard lots of anecdotal evidence and seen lots of anecdotal evidence that biting insects seem to prefer some people over others. Mostly what they're homing in on is carbon dioxide and body heat. So it could be that if you're, you know, a heavy sweater or you're respiring really heavily or exercising more than other people in the group, that might do it. Wearing dark clothing often attracts them a little bit more. I think they just instinctively head towards dark areas because they can kind of blend in a little more easily. I suspect there have been scientific studies on this, but I haven't read them. So I don't want to speculate too hard there. I have also heard that if you're drinking, like if you're drinking alcohol, that will also actually make you more attractive to them. I'm not sure if you're expiring extra carbon dioxide from the carbonation or if it's something else, but I have heard if you're drinking alcohol, that does make you slightly more attractive. Again, I'm not actually sure if that's true or not, but I've heard this. This is something that I forget to even mention sometimes, but you know, technically ticks aren't insects, they are arachnids, so they're more closely related to spiders and scorpions than they are to insects, which isn't really relevant from a pest control perspective. You know, it's just that as a taxonomist, I can't help but point that out. And I guess it's also relevant in that they don't have wings. You know, there are no winged arachnids. So at least these things can't fly around like mosquitoes and black flies and stuff. Actually, speaking of black flies, some people were concerned about a bit more black flies or midges around Lake Erie. Are you hearing anything about that at all? So I had a couple of reporters from the St. Catharines area calling and asking me about black fly swarms and midge swarms. Midges are non-biting, but apparently there was quite a boom of them in Lake Erie this year. With such a dry spring, I'd be surprised if there were actually more black flies than usual. But I think what may have happened is we had kind of a cool spring and then it got really hot all at once. It may have caused all of the larval black flies that were waiting for nice weather to emerge all at the same time. So, you know, all the black flies that would have normally kind of emerged over the course of a month or, you know, three or four weeks, they may have all come out in one or two weeks. So it may have just, you know, it would have appeared that there were more black flies all at once, but I think it may have just kind of concentrated the population into a shorter boom. My other little private suspicion is that there might just be more people outside this year because of COVID. And, you know, maybe people buying their first property outside of Toronto and moving to, you know, a nice idyllic cottage locale and then realizing that, you know, oh, there are black flies here and there are not black flies in Toronto as much. So that's my suspicion. I could be totally wrong. Again, this is, this is just me guessing. I haven't studied this in detail. But those are sort of my guesses as to why we're hearing about black fly swarms and midge swarms and everything else right now. This spring was particularly conducive to sort of a short but extreme blast of them. And there's a lot of people outside this year. Andrew, this has been utterly fantastic for us. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you think that our listeners should know? I could plug my research for a minute. Please. So I focus on flies, true flies, diptera. I also am really interested in native pollination. So a lot of the native pollinators people hear about are native bees, which are great. I have colleagues that work on native bees. I really support the research. I love native bees. They're a lot of fun to watch out there. And that's distinguishing from European honeybees, which of course are pollinators, but they are a European species. And I prefer to think of them as livestock. You know, they're very important livestock, but they're not really a a wild native Ontario species. And that's as opposed to wild bees, which my colleagues work on. And then I work on pollinating flies, specifically a family called the flower flies which are probably the most important group of wild pollinators after the native bees. And in some climates, like as you get farther north and it gets cooler, flies do take over from bees as the dominant pollinator. 
So that's sort of the group I work on. We just put out a field guide to the flower flies of the Northeast. So that's everywhere from, it's like east of Manitoba and north of the Carolinas. So all of the species of flower fly in Ontario can be diagnosed as species from a field guide. We're really excited about this book, you know, really hoping this sort of opens the doors for a lot of naturalists who might have started on birds, but now look at butterflies, and dragonflies as well. We're hoping this is sort of the next step in a continuum of people looking at smaller and smaller animals using field guides. Well, if we're talking about branding, flower flies is a pretty good name. Yeah, this is the other thing. So in the UK, they're often referred to as hoverflies. You'll hear that name as well. And uh, they do hover in place, the males, that's sort of part of their mating ritual. But uh, it was actually an American colleague of ours that coined the term flower fly, as far as I know. And it was because they're important pollinators. And he felt that people didn't pay enough attention to hoverflies because they didn't realize what they did. And a name like flower fly might help a bit. So it is partly a branding thing. But, you know, it's, it's an appropriate branding thing because they're on flowers a lot and they're important pollinators. Fascinating stuff. Andrew, I really, really want to thank you for your time today. No problem. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Andrew Young is the Assistant Professor of Systematic Entomology at the University of Guelph. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Raju Mudler, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etesas. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our Director of Programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.